Good afternoon um, for joining us this afternoon for My World by Watch and Walk Ministry um, Truett Seminary Chapter. My name is Ebenezer um, Adujemfi. I'll um, in his article um, on the historical roots of um, ecologic crisis, um, the famed American historian uh, called Lynn Townsend made a statement, and I quote, what people do about the ecology depends on what they think about themselves in relation to the things around them. Human ecology is deeply conditioned by beliefs about our nature and destiny, that is, by religion. Um, these statements underscore the fact that uh, we as humans, um, we cannot do anything about um, the way we, I mean, treat the, the, the ecology or we treat the environment. We cannot salvage the environment or the problem that we are uh, facing if we do not change the way we think about ourselves in relation to the environment. And especially for Christians who claim that God created the world and that the creation is good. And then uh, every, everything that we see deserves attention or care uh, we need to do more. So it's quite disconcerting or uh, quite uh, worrying when we feel or we see that the church um, is silent and less proactive when it comes to creation care um, issues. And um, that is why Watch and Walk, we would like to address or speak to this issue um, with this program, That My World. Uh, our prayer and our hope is that at the end of our discussion today, uh, two things will happen. If you are a minister uh, or a Christian leader, you will learn to integrate creation care intentionally into your ministry. And if you are a Christ follower, a Christian in general, or you're an audience listening to us, um, you just learn um, to um, take care of your world uh, by you know, leveraging the goodness of the Lord. If you're a Christian, you're leveraging salvation uh, to tend your creation. That is our hope. Uh, to help me uh, do that today, I have with me, I have um, three uh, great um, personalities. Uh, first, I have Kofi Edudumfe. Um, Kofi Edudumfe is a journalist, you know, and also, he's also a global goodwill ambassador. And Kofi is also um, a climate reality leader. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, Mr. Kofi Edudumfe. Thank you to Eben. I also have um, Dr. Robert Creech. Um, Dr. Creech is um, the holder of Hubert H. and Gladys Rabon, Professor of Pastoral Leadership, and he's also the Director of uh, Pastoral Ministries at uh, Bayless um, Pruitt Seminary. So, um, Dr. Creech, welcome to my world. Thank you. It's good to be with you. I've been Thank looking forward. Thank you very much for joining us. And then last but not the least, I have Dr. Roger Olson. Uh, Dr. Olson is a professor of theology, and he he's also the holder <laughs> of the Foy Valentine Chair of Christian Theology and Ethics at uh, John W. Truett uh, Seminary. Uh, Dr. Olson, thank you, and welcome to my world. Good to be with you. Um, thank you very much um, for joining us for this discussion. Now, um, before I, I, I let uh, Dr. Creech offer the opening prayer for us, I'd like to read um, a passage from scripture that, I mean, we look at a lot of things, but it, by and large, that will be the foundation of what we've been talking about when we talk about um, creation care. I'm reading from Genesis. You know, Christian, we uh, look at Genesis as um, the backbone, I mean, the background of our creation theology. So I just want to look at Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Genesis chapter 1, um, verse 26 and to 28. I read, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, in his 
image God created him, male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and then he said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, um, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on, on the earth. And then um, there's also another uh, creation account in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. I'm just taking one verse from that. That is verse 15, chapter 2, verse 15 says that, Then the Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden uh, to tend it and then to keep it. So that is, um, by and large, where we take our uh, Christian story from Genesis chapter 1 and 2 uh, for uh, all of us Christians. So I'd like uh, Dr. Chris to offer the opening prayer for us, and then we start our discussion. Thank you, Ebenezer. I'm going to borrow a prayer that is, was penned by um, Pope Francis, and it's a prayer for the earth. And what he expresses here is, I think, what our hearts want to express. I'm going to use his words, but we'll pray it together. O oh, powerful God, you are present in the whole universe and in the smallest of your creatures. You embrace with your tenderness all that exists. Pour out upon us the power of your love that we may protect life and beauty. Fill us with peace that we may live as brothers and sisters, harming no one. O oh God of the poor, help us to rescue the abandoned and forgotten of this earth, so precious in your eyes. Bring healing to our lives that we may protect the world and not prey upon it, that we may sow beauty, not pollution and destruction. Touch the hearts of those who look only for gain at the expense of the poor and the earth. Teach us to discover the worth of each thing, to be filled with awe and contemplation, to recognize that we are profoundly united with every creature as we journey toward your light. We thank you for being with us each day. Encourage us, we pray, in our struggle for justice, love, and peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Creech, uh, for offering that prayer. Uh, I'd like to start uh, with Kofi. Um, you have been in the uh, development journalism for some time, environmental issues, and traveling all over uh, the world, um, covering um, even with... Uh, the climate conference and all that. Help us understand um, the seriousness of this issue before we look at you know, the, the, the Bible um, that we just read. Uh, how, how seriously should we take this when we talk about climate issues, climate care, when we talk about environmental um, issues? Well, thank you very much, Eben, for this opportunity. And I think um, I'm very, very excited um, to be part of this um, noble um, exercise. Um, one thing that I always say is that as Christians, as humanity, we have the responsibility to tend um, our land or our environments. And um, what is the phenomenal climate change that is currently happening it should be the concern of everybody. And that is what I always say that um, talking about climate change should be everybody's responsibility because it affects everybody. Nobody is immune from um, the impacts of um, climate change. Um, I would um, seek your indulgence to share uh, my slides with you um, as part of uh, my short uh, presentation. And um, uh, just a moment. Uh, um, is it visible now, please? Yeah. Okay, so um, what you see is the uh, famous marble, blue marble image that shows our Earth from space. And this reminds us that we are all sharing in the same home, the home that was created by our Lord, our God. And I also need to um, let you understand that um, this is how creation was made but along the line uh, natural greenhouse gas layers were made for our own good uh, you see uh, the sun and the earth and the yellow lines you see uh, on this slide represent the energy uh, from from the sun but what has really happened over the years the sun's rays come through the air and warm up the earth and then as that heat turns into energy, the energy is absorbed. 
by the layer. The infrared you see on this slide brings a lot of the heat back out. Now, I'm just trying to explain uh, the science of what is um, happening. Mm. So some of it is trapped by uh, the natural greenhouse gas layer. And of course, this I can say is, is good uh, for us. But the problem is, is getting thicker and more of the outgoing infrared radiation is trapped. That is where we currently find the challenge. It's getting thicker because we are spewing 152 million tons of man-made global warming pollution into it every day. And it's treating it like an open sewer. So um, you ask where are all these coming from? A lot of sources from landfills, uh, through transportation, burning for, uh, forest and cropland, animal agriculture, the permafrost is thawing and it, it, it's playing out a role um, currently. One of um, the biggest sources by far is our reliance on fossil fuels. And since uh, World War II, that's been going up dramatically. So fossil fuels constitute the largest of um, the challenges we are currently facing. And, and that is what um, I want all of us to uh, put our minds to. As a result, the temperatures are going up very fast. It's unmistakably clear that the scientists are telling us that this year already, we have more than 70% chance of being the hottest year ever measured with instruments. And I must say that this is scientific. And 19 of the 20 hottest years we've ever seen since 20, um, 2001. And the five hottest we have uh, had is in the last um, five years alone. I think you are in the US. Um, we are seeing the heat go up all over the world. And in Miami, in the US where you are, you've had the hottest week ever um, this year. Not only in the US, Australia in the winter had several months ago experienced very um, extreme weather conditions. And here in Ghana, we are also um, not left out. Um, we are among um, African countries that are recording all round or all year round high uh, levels of temperature. And I must say that when it comes to Africa, we remain very vulnerable because um, of our poor um, economies and, and conditions. Now, Europe as well, it goes on and on and on. It's telling you that uh, the reality on the ground, it's something that everybody should attune uh, their the mind to. So <clears throat> the world as a whole, it's, 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 um, it's getting into uh, the tipping point, I must say. And like I said, it's as a result of most of the human activities on the environment. Over the years, I have, as you said, I've attended a lot of conferences talking about what we need to do um, to be able to reverse these um, changes that we experience in the extreme weather conditions. One of the most profound um, documents that has come out um, out of the climate change talks is the uh, Paris Agreement. And um, the Paris Agreement stipulates that the whole world needs to do something and do it faster to be able to reverse um, the trend of um, climate change. So you, the question you ask is, what do we really need to do to be able to um, reverse some of these um, mm. um, changes that we, we are experiencing? Okay. Yeah. The critical ones are in the area of green energy, moving into solar and wind, most especially. Um, just to uh, take a look, 20 years ago, the best predictions uh, were for wind energy. Um, and, and now is the main thing to go. If we, we are to um, go green, wind is one of the most powerful um, energy sources that we need to be attuning our minds to. Um, we also need to be looking at um, solar energy. 
uh, which is also very critical. Um, okay. It's, 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 it's being predicted that solar is, is going to be the, the game changer in, in, the, in, the, in the future. Okay. So what I'm trying to drive, drive out is that we've seen a lot of changes in the past um, decades, um, centuries, regards human activities on the environment. And science has proven to us that these changes is leading to the, the, change, uh, the, the climate change that we are currently experiencing. Okay. The only means for us to survive as a people is to begin to retract our steps okay. and see how best we can invest in green sources and uh, try as much as possible to uh, go slow on uh, the use of fossils to be able to survive the future. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Donfe. Uh, thanks a lot for that. Now, um, I'd like to ask Dr. Olsen uh, this question. Now, based on what Kofi has shared, I mean, obviously, we are feeling the groanings um, of, of nature, of, of creation. And as I, I read, you know, from, even from the beginning, um, this is the world, I mean, this is God's creation and presents, we, we profess creationism. Help, help us understand the, even the scripture and even your own understanding um, of, of the Bible and how we, we look at this theologically. What do the, the scriptures mean when it, it talks about creation, God creating the world, giving man, you know, uh, some sort of dominion or authority? What do those scriptures mean? And what do they not mean when it talks about the kind of authority or stewardship that God has given us? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, let me say that um, this is not any kind of new subject that uh, theologians have been wrestling with this all of my adult lifetime. I can remember when I was in seminary in the 1970s, we talked about this. I don't remember what year it was, but and maybe Dr. Creech can help me here. It was a very famous or infamous essay published by a scientist by the name of White. Robert, do you remember his first name? Is it Lynn White? Lynn White, thank yeah. you. Yeah, so I don't remember the year, but it was sometime I think in the 70s or 80s, Lynn White published this article that really blamed Christianity or the Bible and biblical Christianity and Judaism for the ecological crisis. And it all pinned on that word dominion and how that's been traditionally interpreted. And a lot of us agree with Lynn White that it has been misinterpreted throughout much of Western history. In Europe and North America, many Christians have interpreted God's mandate that we have dominion over the earth as the right to exploit the earth for our own purposes, for our own comfort, our own flourishing. But in the last few decades, there's really been a turnaround in at least academic and scholarly Christian circles arguing against that interpretation and saying that was a huge mistake. And Lynn White, who is a critic of Christianity, but nevertheless helped bring this to our attention, I think, to reconsider what dominion meant in the Bible and in Christian tradition, and to see it as never having meant the right to exploit the earth for our own comfort, uh, but rather what we would call stewardship today. Uh, the call, the mandate to be good stewards of the earth and of creation. So there's just been a plethora of books and articles written about that. Uh, you cannot go to any uh, professional theology meeting of any size without hearing this and hearing it talked about. <clears throat> and I would agree with that. I think that is what we ought to interpret dominion to mean is stewardship. And that has just always seemed fairly obvious to me. I know there are people who disagree and who still think that since Jesus is coming back, why should we take care of the earth? Um, he's going to uh, destroy it and renovate it, start over again, or whatever their belief is about that. 
And uh, I think, you know, as Christian theologians, it's part of our task to correct them at that point and say, look, even from just a human perspective, not even necessarily just from a Christian perspective, but just from a human perspective, we have to recognize that the crisis that we've just heard about, again, is devastating and is going to lead our children and grandchildren into great misery if we don't turn things around quickly. Hmm. And I, I am hearing that talked about in progressive churches, and those are the only ones that I go to, so I don't really know what <laughs> talked about okay. in fundamentalist churches or not. I would hope so. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Olson, uh, for that um, analysis there. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Creech, well, um, you've been a pastor for a long time, and you, I mean, know the situation with, with our pastoral uh, leadership and churches. Um, help, help us understand also why is it that, I mean, based on what uh, Kofi said and also what Dr. Olson said, why is it that this is not really at the foreground of um, the, church's, uh, the church's witness? Why is the pulpit, you know, a bit reticent when it comes to <clears throat> care? Uh, what is really missing? Yeah, uh, I think uh, on my list of things would include the two things that Roger just talked about is we've got a misunderstanding of the theology of dominion where we've seen it as exploitation rather than um, care and uh, stewardship. There's one. The second is that we've, we've had um, a view of end times that is a kind of escapist version. Jesus is coming. I've heard people say, uh, we don't need to worry about world oil supplies. Jesus gave us enough uh, oil in the earth to last till he comes back. And so we can use all we want. And uh, there's no need to take care of this world. It's going to be destroyed, which is not only, you know, not only we misread Genesis 1, we've misread the passage in Second Peter about this earth and it's being, it's going to be renewed, Peter says. And uh, John says in Revelation 21, a new heaven and a new earth. But we've had an eschatology of escape. We're going we're gonna to leave this world behind <clears throat> and go to heaven when we die. There's a third, I think, co contributing idea that's kept pastors from addressing this and lots of other issues. And here I um, want to refer to Wendell Berry. And he, was, he says that what developed in the United States is a kind of Southern gospel uh, came out of the reticence of the pulpit to address the issue of slavery. That when you had Southern churches with slaves in the balcony and slave owners on the first floor, and the pastor's salary was dependent upon those on the first floor, uh, it became safer to talk about going to heaven, about prayer, about spiritual things, rather than talking about how the gospel applies uh, to the issue of slavery or war or economics or many, many other issues. And he said, so what developed in Southern churches in the U.S. and we exported to many, many places was this kind of Southern gospel that's all about going to heaven when you die and not about how we're to live right now. Uh, and um, that's carried over. So right now, the pastor in, say, a church where I served in Houston, Texas, where large numbers of people in that congregation make their living uh, working in petrochemical plants uh, to stand in the pulpit and address the issue of climate change requires some kind of, you know, it requires stepping over a line because they would rather you just talk about prayer and going to heaven when we die. Those are important subjects, but the gospel is more, is fuller than that. And I, so I think that's part of it, this um, kind of Gnostic theology where we have separated the material world as not on our agenda and it's just the spiritual world that matters for us. And we've lived with a kind of Gnosticism in um, Christianity, particularly in the South, but I'm sure it's in other places as well. And we certainly exported our share of it. Hmm. So that's a couple of things I think about. Wow. wow. <clears throat> thanks, thanks a lot, um, Dr. Creech. So uh, the point is that most of the time we lack the confidence, we lack the boldness to address it because of the kind of people um, in our congregation. And uh, I, I think as, as believers, uh, we should learn, especially Christian leaders, we should learn from that. 
Kofi, I've been a church, um, I mean, Christian, a Christ follower for all these years, and you, you've talked to your friends and you've observed uh, people who, you know, who attend church every day. What, what, is, what seems to be the problem there? I think sometimes um, we seem to divulge ourselves as Christians from the fact that the environment is part of our um, um, service to God. Um, if we, there is a saying that uh, cleanliness is next to godliness, um, you can't live in an environment that is filthy, that is uh, not clean, and prefers to be living the Christ life. I always uh, allude to the fact that um, God, when he created man, placed him in a garden. And the garden signifies the environment in which we are living in. The Bible tells us that everything was in the garden to, for, for man to use to, to, to survive. In other words, under no circumstance should a, someone who professes to be a Christian do anything to harm what God has given us to, for our survival. I'll give you a typical example of uh, what I've observed um, within um, Christendom. When I, went, I go about planting trees, for instance, somebody will ask you why you are spending a lot of time um, in communities trying to engage them to uh, replant what they've uprooted, um, trying to green their environment, why not use the same energy uh, to win souls for Christ? Then my argument is that they go hand in hand. Um, if I win a soul for Christ and that soul is not living right, the person will turn around and accuse God of not giving him or her a good environment to live in. But when you create a conducive environment for people to live, Worshipping God becomes even easier. Hmm. So it's high time we link Christianity to um, not just a matter of faith and living righteousness as a matter of spirituality, but being holistic in the way we worship. Worship is not just spiritual, but something physical physical as to how you relate to your people, people around you, um, or humanity. And humanity <coughs> also encompasses the environment. Hmm. So the conclusion that I want to um, allude to is the fact that Christianity should not just be looked at um, as just something that is um, spiritual, but something that can also be holistically physical and the physical involves how we relate to um, our fellow humans as well as the environment in which we live in. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, um, Kofi, uh, for that submission. Um, so what you said remind, reminded me of what, what I picked when I was um, learning Hebrew. Uh, the word for worship is the same word for work, you know, aboda, and it's the same word that the Hebrew uses for worship and then in this context like what we do the work we do i mean in the environment is a way of worship and as kofi is uh, pointing out the idea that we have this narrow view of worship is about going to church and then receiving the sacraments and then you know partaking of these um, activities but doesn't have anything to do with the way we treat the environment and uh, thanks uh, for that insight uh dr olsen so from what kofi said it means that there is something we can do uh, to leverage, I mean, to turn our, to turn our creation, we, we, there's something we can do uh, in the understanding of our salvation. And how do we leverage? What, what would be the, how can the right construct of our salvation experience help us to really turn the environment? That's what I want to say. Well, I get asked these questions all the time in my theology classes. And I usually begin by saying, go ask Dr. Creech. <laughs> Because Dr. Creech is the practitioner. He's a pastor, 
and I haven't. I've, I've served on church staffs, but I've never been a lead pastor of a church, especially not a large church. But I have sat in the pews a lot and listened and participated in many churches over my lifetime, and I've certainly observed what Dr. Creech said about pastors being under tremendous pressure. My father was a pastor for 52 years, and I can remember him talking at home about the various segments of the, popul of the uh, congregation and individuals and you know, how to keep them in the church when he was preaching things that um, maybe they considered kind of stepping on their toes, so to speak. Uh, that was a phrase that people used, you know, that uh, when the pastor stepped on people's toes, he was in real danger. You know, you didn't mix the gospel with anything else. And the gospel just meant what Dr. Creech was talking about in the churches I grew up in, how to get to heaven. So what do we do? Uh, I think we need holy boldness. And I think I, I encourage my students when they're interviewing to possibly be a pastor of a church or a church professional to tell the committee and the congregation before they sign on the dotted line and become the pastor or assistant pastor or whatever, that they are going to preach the whole gospel. And they're going to promote the whole gospel, which includes creation and it includes poverty. It includes many things that people have not traditionally thought of as part of the gospel. And if the church says, no, we're not gonna let you do that, then I really think they just need to not be at that church. Now, a lot depends on how you say it, of course. I'm not encouraging people to be a bull in a china shop and go in and just say, I'm going to come in and tear everything up and you know, tell you that you're all horrible people and so forth. But I think you do need to make clear to the congregation that you're going to preach the whole gospel, including God's care for creation, and that we, it's part of our discipleship that we participate with God in liberating the creation from bondage to decay. Ultimately, only God can do that, but we can do a lot in the meantime. And um, so there's just so many things I think a pastor can do. For example, uh, don't begin with a sermon on um, fossil fuels and how we need to move away from them, but begin with a sermon on uh, a holistic view of creation. The creation is a gift from God to us and that God wants us to care for it just as he wants us to care for souls and that they go to heaven. And, um, you know, begin at a very simple place and move on from there. Don't, you know, grab the bull by the horn, so to speak, immediately, but work your way toward it. And then end up with some concrete suggestions, maybe a year or two years into your pastoral ministry that the church use solar power, that the church use wind power, that the church look for electric providers that do that instead of rely on ones that use nuclear or, or fossil fuel and so forth, and then begin to raise the consciousness of the church through Sunday school lessons and through Bible studies and even from the pulpit. Uh, I've seen it done very well, and I think it can be done. Um, but, you know, a lot of our churches, as Dr. Creech was saying, are very closed-minded toward that, especially in the South. Not only in the South, I've seen it happen elsewhere. Um, so, yeah, I, I think we need to be as, as wise as serpents and harmless as doves uh, as we go about this, but, but keep pressing forward and not give in to the Gnostic gospel that Dr. Creech so ably talked about, is so prevalent. Okay, don't give in to the Gnostic gospel. And that's a bold um, thing to do when you tell the committee that you're gonna preach the whole gospel. Um, because that's what God would have us do. Um, I remember the Paul's, um, addressed to the Ephesians, Ephesian elders in Acts 20, where he told them, uh, I'm now innocent of the blood of all men, because I'm not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. And I think that's what we, God really wants us to do. But the qu question is, will you be able to declare the whole counsel of God when it's going to affect, possibly affect your paycheck? Uh, <laughs> that is, uh, that's, that's a difficult, but then that is the gospel that God has called us to. And, and that's what we have to be committed to. Uh, Dr. Creech, 
before you come in, I mean, uh, someone sent a question. I think Cecily McQueen sent your question to you uh, before you, you talked about having the right construct of salvation. Uh, she obviously, from her question, kind of knows you uh, more. That I, I wonder what Dr. Creech has learned about taking care of God's creation, working on his farm, Creech farm. Uh, she understands you've, you've been doing a lot of uh, farming. So uh, it, has it taught you anything? Well, Farming's an exaggeration. Gardening might be more appropriate. <laughs> we have a large garden, but we also are restoring 80 acres of land to native prairies and grasses, and for a variety of reasons. Uh, one of those we're just getting into. I was on a call yesterday with a work group from Rice University, the Baker Institute. They're working, one of the things that's been learned about grasslands and prairies is that they take the carbon dioxide from the air and store it, but they store it in the soil because almost two thirds of uh, prairie grasses are below the surface. And so they, in some ways, store carbon from the atmosphere better than forest, which have it mostly above the ground. Then when you have fires like in California right now, that carbon's released back into the atmosphere. When grasses burn, there's just a smaller percentage of it is going back into the atmosphere. So uh, we are, that's one of the reasons we're doing the project is to help contribute to a little healthier air. I mean, 80 acres is only 80 acres. That's a small piece, postage stamp, smaller than that. Uh, but it's what we have and that's what we have to work with. So we're learning. Uh, another thing I'm learning living here is to be with uh, God's creation. I mean, we've been dry for <clears throat> several weeks, 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 very hot and dry. And we've got three and a half inches of rain today and it's raining right now and we're loving it. You know, you used to, you know, oh, it's raining. Ah, I can't get out and do anything. So, oh, it's raining. The, <laughs> uh, the creation is receiving what it needs to thrive right now. And you sort of rejoice in what God does in caring for the place. Hmm. All right. And um, thanks a lot for, for those who are who joined us. We are still uh, talking about creation care. Uh, this is my world by watch and walk. I uh, uh true seminary chapter. Uh, my name is Ebenezer DGMV. I'm here with uh, Kofi Adudunfe, uh, I'm a journalist. I'm here with um, Dr. Roger Olsen, um, professor of theology, and, I'm, and then Dr. Uh, Robert Creech, um, professor, professor of um, pastoral um, ministry or leadership, even at Truett. Uh, thank you very much uh, for those who have joined us. And I'd, I'd like to continue by looking at the simple things that we can do. Uh, we've talked about uh, some of them, but let me start with Kofi. Now, you've been in the media uh, profession for some time, and I'd mm -hmm. like you to just focus on that area and also being a journalist and also a church uh, attendant, or let me say active church attendant, of course, a, a very good Christian too. Uh, what would you tell people who are listening, who are in, the, in your media profession, and also those who are, you know, in the pews, or the, your laymen, lay uh, believers, or lay, lay theologians, if you may call them that way, what would you ask them to do uh, to help uh, tend creation? Okay, thank you. And that's, that's a very beautiful one um, because that is the bottom line. What do we need to do to um, really care for um, nature? And um, I love the submission by Eugene that uh, the church, for instance, should start thinking about how um, they can also go green. For instance, if you um, have the ability to go solar, why not go now than um, uh, focus on hydro um, if it's better for you to use wind and um, solar? This is the time for you to do it as a church. But let me come at the individual level. And, and sometimes that is what is very critical because we, we tend to look at the corporate level, what's the expected of the government, what's expected of my local authority or my church leader. But the question is, as an individual, what is expected of you to care for, for, for your environment? The first thing that I always say is that don't do anything that will hurt the environment. For instance, we, a lot of people are uh, moving about um, 
cutting down trees um, without thinking about the implications, without thinking about how oxygen is generated. And they really don't see the need to even replace the tree that is cut. So if you are into, for instance, um, the construction industry and you are in the church and you are going about your business of, for instance, constructing um, a housing project anywhere, think about how many trees you can cut and the implications and why you need to replace around that environment where you are developing your, your, your project. What can you do in your immediate homes? Can you plant one or two trees, even in the church? Uh, for instance, I personally uh, have to plant a couple of trees around my church building just to not only beautify, but also generate the right oxygen for us to worship when we go to church. These are basics that we can all do. And one of the things that we as journalists, people in the media, for instance, need to also do is to talk more about nature and how we need to care for it. It cuts across. If you are a Christian and you are a journalist, you have double responsibilities. Whilst you are caring for the um, environment, you also need to be an advocate of greening your environment it's for your own good and for the good of all. As I'm speaking to you now, people are talking about extreme weather conditions here in Ghana because when uh, the sun does come, it's scorchy, hot, and highly unbearable. And when the rains also come, they come torrentially and they are always at the extremes. And people keep asking, why are we experiencing this? There are impacts on the road uh, infrastructure. In fact, every facet of the economy, um, diseases, we are currently talking about COVID-19. If you don't have the right environment to live in, the impacts are exacerbated because you don't have the right conditions to contain um, diseases. So from health to infrastructure to every facet of livelihoods, there are impacts. And as an individual, being a Christian or um, a journalist or in any other profession, you should attune your mind to what are the busy small little things that I need to do. Plant a tree when it's your birthday. Um, if it's the birthday of your kid or any relatives, um, do something symbolic with the greening of the environment. Be an advocate and see how best at the individual level will translate into collective responsibility that we will holistically say that we are Christians that care for the world that our Lord has created for us. Okay. Thank you very much um, for that, um, Kofi. Now, um, Dr. Olsen, I've uh, been teaching, um, you know, seminary students for a lot of years and being in this, you know, profession in theology, uh, what do you think, you know, Christian teachers, you know, educators, uh, theologians can also do um, to, you know, create the awareness and encourage people to uh, be intentional when it comes to integrating creation care into their witness? Mm -hmm. Well, of course, when we come to the doctrine of creation in my classes, as you know, we always incorporate into it some discussion about ecology and environmentalism. Uh, I would I'd like to build on some things Kofi was saying, and um, there are some things that I probably can't say until I retire. These, <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll put a couple of them out here now. I really think part of our work with the environment is to limit our family size. Mm. My wife and I chose to stop after two children, and part of it was uh, because of overpopulation. And I know that there's a, there are a lot of people, both Christian and non-Christian, who think that um, there's more than enough on the earth for, for billions and billions of more people, but I don't really think so. I can remember way back in high school reading Maltus's um, analysis of overpopulation and sitting back and really thinking about it in terms of the future and how many children I would want to have. And um, 
I think that uh, some of the TV shows that Christians watch that kind of glorify having 19 or 20 children and so forth are things that we can talk about in churches and in, in classes and say, is that really good for the environment? Is that really good for anybody to have 19 or 20 children today? Now, there may have been a time when that wasn't particularly a problem for the environment, but today I think it is a problem for the environment because the more people there are, the more we're going to consume of the environment, trees and um, fuel and so on and so forth. So um, I think family size is one issue. I think another size that's worth, or another thing that's worth talking about is cremation. And I personally favor cremation because I think that uh, just burying dead bodies in the ground uses up precious um, area that could be used for planting uh, food or feeding people. And I look at some of the older cemeteries, such as where my mother is buried, and it's just acres and acres and acres of graves. And almost none of them are ever visited by anybody anymore. Uh, the people have been long forgotten. Um, up where I come from in the north, people decorate graves on Memorial Day, not just soldiers' graves, but relatives' graves. And I would always go there and decorate my mother's grave when I could. But the vast majority of graves never <clears throat> decorated because there was no one around to remember them and to decorate them. Hmm. In a lot of traditions, they uh, dig up the bodies after a while, if they bury them, and uh, reuse the graves. I would say, I think cremation is a, is a real alternative that we need to think about. So those are just two examples of things that I know a lot of people aren't going to want to hear about, but I think are worth yeah. us and talking about. Wow, wow. Yeah, we are really well, worth pondering. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Olson. Uh, before I go to you uh, to make your fin um, the final comment, uh, Dr. Creech, I have a, a question. It's more like a rhetorical question. Um, Nana, Nana Ochebwaten is worried. He said that, I wonder why any true Christian would do anything to hurt the very environment that sustains our lives while the second coming of Christ tarries. Um, it doesn't really make sense. Um, but that is the reality we are facing um, right now with alarmism, uh, alarmism and alarmism <clears throat> trying to, you know, uh, people who come and they say that people are trying, just trying to exaggerate. So, but they already, God has already prophet, I mean, promised or talked about it in the Bible. So why do we care? And they always, you know, claim that those who think about creation are just alarmists. So that is uh, the reality. And Dr. Creechie, <laughs> Um, your message to pastors, I think uh, Dr. Olson talked about even some of the things that they can do to create the awareness in, 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 in the church. But uh, you, you talked about some of the problems, some of the difficulties that just uh, quickly address um, pastors, church leaders. Sure. Yes. I want to add one thing to something we've been talking about. We talk about creation care as if it were its own little slice but it's tied to so many issues of justice. The people who will hurt the most because of climate change are poor people. And um, there's that. Even the COVID-19 crisis is not unrelated to the way that we have exercised dominion and invaded places on the earth and brought back diseases from animals that we really weren't intended to have contact with. I mean, <clears throat> our behavior on the planet has consequences. And um, so just want to add that it's not an isolated, it's connected to everything. Uh, your question, <clears throat> uh, what are some practical ways that Christ followers can integrate this in their lives? One thing I would say it's really important is to live it before you lead it. Mm. Uh, we examine our own lifestyle choices as a pastor, our own consumption, our own practices, and we have no place for judgmentalism because all of us are complicit in what goes on. If we ever drive a car, if we heat our houses or cool them, if we eat food from the grocery store, anything we do has had a part in to play and so we're all complicit and we need to you know just rule out any judgmentalism or high force position on this and and work on our own lifestyles we change in our own life what's easy to change and then we work on changing the things that are more difficult to change about our consumptive habits what we purchase and why and the thing that brings us closest to our connection to the earth is something we do three times every single day if we're fortunate and that is we eat our food supply is our closest connection to the soil. And 
uh, just how we eat, what we eat, where it comes from, how far it's transported, all of those things contribute, or are contributions uh, to part of the problem. There's been a movement uh, in the last couple of decades called slow eating, and that is an acronym. It stands for eating things that are seasonal, what's growing right now, things that are local, grown within a, a reasonable amount of distance from our own place so that it's not transported and we've added calories to that. Uh, things that are organic, not for health reasons, because orga but organic growing methods have to do with how the soil is treated. Uh, and things uh, uh, that are whole, not processed food, eating holes. So, so um, seasonal, local, organic, and whole is slow eating. That's one thing we can do. I would encourage anybody, right? if you live in an apartment in the city, get a pot and grow a pepper plant. Do something to grow some of your own food as a reminder that the food comes from the soil, from the earth, from the sky. This is God's gift to us. Uh, so live it before you lead it. A second thing I would say is that we have to learn to have affection for the creation. Stewardship is a good model, but I think an even a better model is that we are participants in creation. We share it with all the other creatures on the earth. And to learn to know them, to know them by name, is a way of learning affection for the creation. Um, living here in the country, we have all kinds of creatures that we deal with, and I'm trying to learn their names. I'm learning the names of plants and animals and insects and reptiles and all kinds of things, because once you know their name, you know a little bit about their life habits, uh, you're not so quick to be afraid of them or as quick to destroy them. So learn some affection for the creation. Learn to love what God loves. And then I would say preach and teach God the goodness of God's creation. Genesis 1 and 2 are important places to start. And my goodness, it's all through Scripture. Uh, the book of Deuteronomy is full about instructions about how Israel is to care for the land that's going to give them life. Um, the Psalms are full of references to God as creator of heaven and earth. The book of Isaiah is rich with references to God as creator. The book of Job, especially the last three chapters in there, are so full of references. The New Testament proclaims Christ as the creator of all things. And on it goes. The book of Revelation closes with the new heaven and the new earth, another garden. And uh, so I would say preach and teach the goodness of preaching. Here's one thing. Uh, and Dr. Olson said this earlier is, you don't get up and lambast people about their behavior. You teach them what the Bible says. And Baptists, particularly, are the tradition I'm from. Uh, if we had started there, we wouldn't be in this mess. If we'd started with Scripture and said, what does Scripture say about our relation to creation? But now it seems like we've come late to the party, and so you get branded politically as progressive or liberal or something if you're talking about those things. But really, we're just talking about what the Bible said. If there were no climate crisis right now, none, if it were perfect, we should still be teaching and preaching those things because they're in Scripture. So yeah. I would say those are some things that I would underscore. Wow. Oh, thank you very much, um, Dr. Krish, uh, for those uh, comments there. Right. Um, we will do this again, God willing, next semester. I mean, this is a made in addition. Uh, we can, uh, definitely cannot cover everything, but I believe what we have learned um, would help us and will go a long way to encourage all of us to be intentional about the way uh, we take care of uh, our creation. Um, I, I, I picked a thought from a book I read. I think Dr. Creech gave me that book about creation uh, care. And one thing that I, I learned uh, was that you know, the, the fact that Jesus became man or became a human being, that, that is the, the greatest validation of the goodness of creation, um, that God became matter, God became material. And so if for us, um, I think there's this author, Dean, Dean Drummond, uh, was talking about the fact that for us, if we say that God became material, then we are saying that creation is, 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 is worthy and it's, it's valuable and we need to take care of it. And if we think about that, then this whole idea of deep incarnation, we, we look at incarnation and it encourages us uh, to be intentional about the way we take care of um, our environment. So uh, thank you very much. Um, I would let uh, Dr. Olsen pray for us, but before that, I'll just say thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, Kofi. Kofi is a, a journalist. And um, thank you, Dr. Uh, Robert Creech. Um, Professor of Pastoral Ministry, Ministry and Pastoral Leadership uh, at Truett Seminary. And then thank you very much, uh, Dr. Olsen, uh, Professor of Theology at Bayless uh, Truett Seminary.
And God willing, um, next semester will come your way again uh, with My World um, Part 2. But let's end with a prayer from Dr. Olsen. So I chose a poem for my prayer. Great. And I'm going to try to share the screen so you can um, actually read it along with me as a prayer. Okay. It's called God's Grandeur by a Catholic theologian, a uh, poet and theologian named Gerard Manley Hopkins. So let's pray. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. Why do men then now not wreck his rod? Generation fraud have trod, have trod. And all is spray, bleared, smeared with toil. And wears man's smudge and shares man's smell. The soil is bare now nor can foot feel being shod. For all this, nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness deep down things. And though the last lights off the black west went, oh, morning at the brown brink eastward springs, because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and with awe bright wings. Amen. Amen.